I'm going to do a quick reminder as to what we're dealing with here. All right. We're, we're dealing with Jesus in his, in his final um, emergence into the town openly in Jerusalem. He's already raised Lazarus from the dead. And when he did that, what did the crowd, and remember, we talked about the crowd that was following him, right? And this crowd that was following him, this crowd is made up of what kind of people? People that are following him because they what? They yeah, like him. Please. They what? They're curious. Some believe he's the Messiah. Some are following him because it's what? Entertaining. He's like doing all kinds of wonderful stuff. Some people are following him because they are what? Upset. Mm -hmm. So what we found in watching this is that Jesus draws a what? A crowd. But not everybody is there for the same reason. There are some people there because they really want to understand what, what does this man got to say? I'm curious. Other people are there because whenever I was when I was there last time he turned he, he, he multiplied bread and I got fed and so hey seems like when I'm around him I get good things. And so a lot of people are following him because they feel they can get something from Jesus. Now, is that really how you should build relationships? I want to hang around you because I can get something from you. I don't care about you. I just want to get something from you. Is that how we should build relationships? Mm -hmm. Not really, right? But do we see that a lot? Mm -hmm. So what am I pointing out here? Nothing new. This, this is 2,000 years ago. It's still happening today. Right? People that are following Jesus because he's entertaining. Right? That's what they would, you know, hey, do another miracle. You know, uh, let me see another wonder. They're following him because, well, do people go to religious experiences for that same, I just want to be entertained. I just want to enjoy myself. That's still going on today? Mm -hmm. So what we see is that what we're reading in these 2,000-year-old manuscripts and what we see in 2017 is very much what? The same. Not a whole lot of difference. All right. So we're going on with that. There are other people that are following Jesus that are mad at him. They don't like him. But the interesting thing about the, the people that don't like him is that these are not like people that say, I don't believe in God or atheistic people. These are what kind of people? Religious. Religious folks. The scribes and the Pharisees. They tout about religion. They tout about the laws of Moses. But their main goal, especially after word got back that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, their mindset was, we got to do what? We got to kill him. We got to get rid of this guy. Why do we got to get rid of him? Because they are already entrenched in the religious leadership. All the power, financial gain, the prestige, and the honor that they have built up for themselves is now what? Threatened by who? By Jesus. Do we see that today? Do we see religious people that want to build up power and honor and wealth? And that's why they're in it, but not in it because they care about eternal souls. See, the, the goal... Mm -hmm. It's just like in the day of Paul in, in Ephesus, the people were listening and being saved and, and hearing the words of Paul, and they were so good that the craftsmen of that day were like, they started a riot, actually, because their craft was in danger. You know, they were selling religious statutes and, mm -hmm. you know, all kinds of crosses and all kinds of pieces of cloth, this piece of cloth will heal you. They wanted to kill Paul because their craft was being put in danger of being set at naught mm -hmm. because of the teachings of the truth that Paul was bringing. Exactly, exactly. And I'll just say that, because I know you two guys, it's the first time here. If you have a question, you can ask it. You don't have to... You know, wait. You know, anytime you got something, if you have a comment, just and we will we will listen to what you got to say. All right. So if you hear something that makes you go, hey, and you got a thought, share it. All right. All right. So let's get into this lesson here.
lesson 153, and we're going to see this continuance of Jesus' experience with these individuals while he's going through Jerusalem openly. We're going to see that uh, eventually he's going to no longer be able to go through openly. But let's look and see what he does, what he says to them. Story 153, the sign of Jonah. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But as the crowds were increasing, he answered and said to them, This generation is an evil and adulterous generation, seeking a sign. And yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For just as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so the Son of Man will be to this generation, three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Men of Nineveh will stand up in the judgment with this generation and will condemn it. For they repented at the proclamation of Jonah. And behold, one greater than Jonah is here. The Queen of the South will rise up with the men of this generation at the judgment and will condemn it because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, one greater than Solomon is here. All right. Good morning. Good morning. So we're looking at this story here now. Um, and we see this continuance of what's going on. Jesus is in the public. He's talking to, we're going to start at 153. Thank you. Um, he's, he's talking to the crowd. He's seeing things. He had already confronted the, the scribes and the Pharisees because they said when Jesus had just cast out a devil, that, well, Jesus must have cast out that devil by the prince of the devils. He's calling Jesus, what? A devil, which is a very dangerous thing. So now Jesus says, well, if I cast the, the devil out by the, the, the uh, spirit of the, of the devil, how do your sons cast him out? And so that controversy uh, had already started. The antagonism of the Pharisees and the scribes is already there. And what we're seeing is we're jumping right back into the middle of it. Now, Look at what this says here. It says, then, after he had discussed to them about how evil spirits work, and he told them that if you, if you have an evil spirit and it gets cast out, that you must make sure that when you clean the, yourself of evil spirits, that you must fill yourself up with what? The spirit of God. Because if you don't, then what's going to happen? The evil spirit is going to do what? Come back. Come back. All right? And when it comes back, it's going to be what? Worse. Worse. Okay? So now they go on. And look at how the scribes and the Pharisees, and I want to point this out about people like this. Watch this. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him saying, teacher. Now, I underline and highlight that word teacher. Because to me, that is very, um, it, it, it's, it's, it's not sarcastic. It is sucking up. It's trying to give a false allegiance. It is, pre it is a pretense. Because they don't really care about Jesus. But they, they're dealing with Jesus openly in the what? In the midst of this crowd. And some of this crowd really like what Jesus is doing. And the one thing that the Pharisees and the, and the Sadducees don't want to do is to turn the what against them? The crowd. Because they are what kind of pleases. People pleases. That's how they get the people to come into them. They have to do what the people want, make sure that the people love them, and they do all these different things so that the people can see them in a good light. So they can't come out and call Jesus what they want to now, because they feel they have to try to get a, an agreement, because every time they go against Jesus, what happens? He makes them look what? Silly. Alright, so now they call him teacher. All right? And it says, we uh, want to see a sign from you. All right? So they're calling him teacher when they don't believe that he... They're not, and not, the reason why I say that, because if I call somebody my teacher, I think I can do what? Learn from that person. If I don't think I can learn, if I think that there is nothing you can teach me that I'm going to even listen to, 
and I still call you teacher, I'm doing it to do what? To swell your head up so I can get what I'm trying to get out of you. They don't care about Jesus. So to use that word of, of giving the inclination that, well, you are somebody I can learn something from, is false. But then they go on and say, we want to see a sign. So now they're saying, well, you know what? Show us your power. Show us how wonderful you are. You know, put on your act. Uh, how will I uh, draw an analogy to this? That's like somebody going to a, a, a police officer or, or a fireman and say, show me how you do a police officer. Show me some police work. Show me some fire work. Some, you know, some, some firemen. Work. And, and you look at him and go, what are you talking about? <laughs> What do you want me to? What do you want me to show you? It's a, it's a ridiculous question, isn't it? Because a person of authority uses the authority when the authority is what needed. Exactly. So therefore, why should you just? I'm a police officer. Why do I need to do anything to show you a sign that I'm a police officer? It's a ridiculous question. Why? If you believe Jesus is God. To say, show me a sign that you are God, is once again saying, well, I don't really believe. Because if I really believe, I don't need a sign. Look at what Jesus, it's like when a parent, a child says to a parent, show me a sign that you're my parent. Well, I've been, <laughs> you see this roof? You see that, you know, are you cold? Are you hot? You see the clothes on you? So to say, show me a sign, is a sign of what? Total disrespect. Total, I don't really believe in you. I'm trying to put you on the what? On the spot. This is the way that these Pharisees and Sadducees are, are looking at Jesus. And Jesus picks it up right away. Because the one thing, and I've said it before and I will continuously say it, you cannot out, out, you can't fool Jesus. You can't fool God. You can't trick him. You can't manipulate him. He knows every motivation. He knows when you're trying to just, you know, let me find out about this so I can get an advantage. He knows every reason. He knows every causality as to why anybody does anything. So they're not going to get over. But they still believe that this is going to be beneficial to them. But Jesus cuts right to the chase and says, But as uh, the crowd was increasing, he answered and said to them, This generation is evil. An adulterous generation. All right, let me stop there for a second. He's talking about the generation that he's walking that, he, that he's walking the earth, and that was one, once again I've said it before. It's what over two thousand years ago. All right, and he's saying that uh, this is a evil and adulterous generation, and it's seeking a sign. All right, let's just make sure that we're not reading this in vain and for no reason. Let's look at our generation. Does this apply to us? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> are we living in an evil you know, we see it don't we? all you need to do is read the newspaper turn on the news you know, some, sometimes you, you, you just need to go outside and you, you, you see it are we living in an adulterous generation yes we are and I'm not just talking about adulterous from the standpoint of uh, uh, being with somebody else's husband or wife we are adulterous in what we commit to and then go to another because see, the, the, the aspect of adultery, in the sense that we've always looked at it, and this is the way that it should be looked at, but there are other ways as well, is when a, a, a man and a woman get married, and one of those individuals um, cheats on that relationship with another person. That's called what? Adultery. adultery. Mm -hmm. Well, it's the same thing. And one of the reasons why he's calling these Pharisees adulterous mm -hmm. and evil it's because they are so-called married to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They're following the laws of who? Of Moses. And Moses told them that another prophet was going to come, like unto me. But when he does come, you're to do what? Follow him. Well, this prophet is here. It's called Jesus. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob uh, followed the God that promised them a Messiah. A deliverer that will deliver them not just from the, this world of 
heartache and disappointment, but he was actually going to pay the bill for what? For sin. Anybody have a hard time sometimes every now and then paying bills? Like, I'm talking about natural bills. You know, get, get rent, mortgage, phone, cable, you know, all that kind of stuff. And sometimes it's like, it's, it's, you, you oh, got this bill. We've all been there. Look at the bill and be like, well, you ain't getting paid this month. <laughs> you know, I've been there. I looked at bills and like, yeah. But there's one bill that I don't care how much you work. I don't care how much effort you put forth. I don't care how much money you got. You can never pay. You cannot pay your sin bill. You can't. You have to trust that Jesus has already paid it for you. And some people struggle trying to pay the sin bill by, by doing doing by being trying to be righteous themselves. I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do all this stuff, and I'm gonna be all this, and I'm gonna be a wonderful person, and I'm gonna go live in the mountains and I'm not gonna do anything wrong. Trying to pay the sin bill, and it's still gonna come up short, because the scripture says that our best righteousness is like what? Filthy, Filthy rags. rags. So the scripture tells us by faith, we just have to believe that when Jesus said that he would die for our sins, that he did just that. And he paid that bill. And all we got to do is what? Accept it. See, if somebody, if you, if you say, well, my cable is turned off. And somebody says, why? Because I didn't pay the bill. And then somebody says, okay, you know what? I'm going to go down to the cable company. I'm going to turn it. You know, so-and-so's cable. Can you, I'm paying that bill. Can you turn it back on? They say, no problem. Turn it back on. And I go back and tell you, I said, your cable's turned back on, man. I paid the bill. And you go, I don't believe it. I'm not turning on this TV because I don't believe that you paid my bill. Now, is the bill paid? Yes, because I paid it. But if you don't believe I paid it and refuse to turn on the cable, you're not getting the what? The benefit, even though it's paid for. The whole gospel, all that we're doing here, it all boils down to this. Jesus paid your bill for sin. And all he wants you to do is believe that he did it and live in it. Now, everything else builds upon that. If you can believe Jesus paid your sin bill, you can go and, re and, and relax and know that when I meet God, when I leave this earth, I will meet him in peace. Because I'm trusting, not in my own righteousness, I'm trusting in what? The righteousness that Jesus gave. Because he paid the bill. Now, if Jesus didn't pay the bill, that makes God what? Lie. But God cannot what? Lie. He cannot lie. So, why am I saying all this? I'm saying all this because this generation is an adulterous generation. An evil and adulterous generation. They're supposed to be following the laws of Moses, but don't believe it. They're supposed to be following the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but don't what? Don't believe it. Yes, Mother. I'm looking at the word as I usually do. Adultery. <laughs> And I'm looking at some of the synonyms for the word adultery. And before I even go to say a couple of them, I want to say that everyone on this earth has committed adultery. Mm -hmm. Not in the sense of sexual adultery, but spiritual adultery. Mm -hmm. Now the synonym for the word adultery means you have acted in bad faith. You have betrayed the Lord. You have cheated on him. You have acted it with faithlessness. You have acted with inconsistency. You have been perfidious. You have been treacherous. In other words, you have followed other gods, all kinds of gods, whether it be a belly god or a materialism god or a carnal god. We have just about been involved in everything. And in so doing, we have showed our faithlessness to God who says that you're only supposed to serve, worship, obey, and live by the words of one God. Mm -hmm. That's it. Right. So let's, let's, let's try to find out, let's identify some of these. I think it's important yeah. that we recognize. Um, all right. Have we all at some point in time served the God of money? Yes. I know I have. I've ch <laughs> like I got to do all I got to do to get money. It becomes your what? But then once the Lord pricks your heart, once you give your heart to the Lord, and you say, Lord, he begins to what? To, to just dwell with you and show you and let you see things. Now, this is where something that I, Regina, Barbara, Mother Peterson, Haywood, 
What? None of us can teach anyone else about this. So, you got to know God for yourself and the fact that he says, I provide for you, not your paycheck. Now, that is a whole, you, you, if you don't know Jesus, if you don't accept him, it's hard to, to comprehend that. Because even though I know God provides for me, I still got to get up in the morning and do what? Go to work. And when I go to work, I still have to be what? A good worker. See, believing that God provides for me doesn't mean I go out and act like a jerk. And show up, you know, I, I ain't got to go to work. I'm trusting in God. No, now I'm being what? Foolish. But God will show you how I will use and manipulate and, and turn things to your favor. And even when things are going difficult, difficulty. Things are going hard. <laughs> I will show you how I will bring you through. And that's not something I can teach. That's something you have to experience. All right. um, because if I teach it, I'm going to give you, you're going to be shortchanged. You're not going to get the full experience. God, in your relationship with him, will bring you through experiences that are tailored for you. So there are certain things that you need to understand about how he operates in, in this universe and how he operates in you that you need personalized, tailored spiritual instruction that only God can give. But you have to ask him for that. You got to ask God to show me, help me, guide me, lead me. That should be your daily conversation. And I, 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 I put on, I go on record to say, and if you give your heart to the Lord and you do that on a daily basis, you will experience His guidance, His leadership, and you will have experiences. That's, and, I, and I tell you how you, you sometimes you know because you will say, "Wow!" And then you go to tell somebody else. You know how they'll look at you? They'll look at you like, "What you talking about?" And then you begin to realize, you know what? They don't, they don't get it. And, and that's the way it should be. Because that's for who? For you. But an adulterous generation is how we generally operate. Like uh, uh, Barbara just read there. There are so many ways. I mentioned what? Money. What about uh, this world and even with the word of adultery? Using it in the sexual aspect. This world, do we worship sex? Do some people worship that? Yes, they do. So some people are chasing that God. The God of power. Authority. Now I can go on and on and on. But those are, those are some that we think, I think we all can identify. I'm sure that we can probably go through the room and we can name a, you know, a dozen more. But the point is that when Jesus called that generation an, an evil and adulterous generation, he's also talking about what generation? This one. He's talking about today. Are we evil? We can, we, uh, and, and you say, well, well you know, I'm, I don't know if I'm evil. Well, I, I know. I, I, I have the ability in me. And you know how I know it? Because I watch it every now and then rise up in me. Now, I shared this before and I'll share it again. Um, there are other ones I'm sure we can all name, but I know one specifically when I'm driving on the highway, man, if somebody cuts me off, man. <laughs> man, if I had one of those buttons on my, my thing that can shoot bullets, I'd, I'd, I'd be shooting it. Because what happens? You get that, that instant. And you're like, you, you're really upset. And why is that? That's because even though the Lord has paid our sin bill, we are still what? Sinners. We are not perfected yet. And but what, what God does, and I almost think sometimes he have a sense of humor, because when I flare up like that, and after I calm down, God says, okay, now how far did that get you? <laughs> Okay, so, so what did you actually benefit from that? And then I feel like Paul. You know, 
that what was me when I would do, do good, good. Yeah. I find myself doing evil yeah. and when I want to do uh, when I don't want to do something I find myself doing yeah. it and the things I want to do I find myself what not doing now that was Paul that said that the one that wrote half of the New Testament That's right. and he recognized I got sin in me and so what God tries to do is to convince you you need me you think you can perfect yourself? You need me. You are an adulterous and evil individual. I don't care how nice you are. You can your friends and your neighbors and your co-workers. Oh, he's a nice person. Oh, she's wonderful. And that's fine. But I'm talking about in comparison to God. When we compare ourselves to the Lord, we fall what? Short. When we look at the writings of Moses, the the um, the Old Testament law, you can't fulfill it, and the law was written to prove we couldn't fulfill it, because the law was written to what to condemn us to the point that no, you are a sinner. Jesus came to do what? Fulfill the law. So the responsibility of the law has been what satisfied. So that's why we're no longer under the law. So we don't have to worship that. And and that's what the Pharisees were doing here. They were adulterous because Jesus was come to liberate them from sin and to fulfill the law. And they wanted to hang on to the law rather than to trust in Jesus because that made them feel what? Special. Wonderful. That's what. I just wanted to say that with respect to the word evil, I would say that we all have evil in us, but by nature, genetic predisposition, we are not evil. Mm -hmm. We are children of God who have been deceived by Satan according to Revelation 12, 9. Therefore, our behavior, our activity, our demeanor, we may do evil, mm -hmm. but we're not innately evil and we can overcome evil. Mm -hmm. You can't. And what the scripture says, you overcome evil with what? Good. With good. That's how you do it. And that's how the law works with you. Because like like mother said, it will pop up in the you know, you 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 can't predict when it pops up, but it shows up and it's just like, here I am. What you gonna do? And the proper response is to allow the spirit of God to lead and guide you through that. And allow God to to speak and work within your mind and then what happens is that you find ways of keeping it under your foot that's what Paul said he had to do he had to keep his flesh where under his foot he had to keep it subjected and so that's an important lifestyle that we learn but we don't naturally do that on our own we need who the help of the Spirit of God yes mother I'm writing something right now about that very subject most people uh, many people cannot identify evil when it pops up in your mind, but a lot of people can because we know the difference between good and evil. But the thing is, when evil evil approaches you as if it's your own thought, and it causes you to try to do something that you know is not right, it will not leave you alone, period. Satan is on his job, and he does not give up. The bottom line is to learn to identify such thoughts whether they be good or whether they be evil, whether they be right or whether they be wrong. And here's a key. Key is when it does present itself to your mind, you have to talk back. You can't say, oh, okay, all right. No, you have to come up with it. Resist it. The Bible says, uh, didn't the Lord say, or did you, <laughs> you know, Satan is a subordinate evil spirit, and if you confront it when it approaches your mind, but the thing is you can't confront it and cast it out for what it is unless you have on the armor of God, which means you have to have the word living in you. That way when it approaches your mind, you say, oh, my Bible said, oh, my Lord said, and then according to the scripture it says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Okay. And so, but you have to talk back. You okay. have to fight with this thing. It, it, we're at war right now. We're in a battle right now. We're at the judgment day period. You have to war with that spirit in your head that tells you to do wrong. You can't just be docile. 
You have to say, the Lord said, God said, Revelation such and such, didn't James, didn't Paul say, fight for your life, because right now you're fighting for your soul, and where you're going to spend eternity. Right. So when the devil approaches you with anything, uh-uh, devil, I see you, I reckon. See, the worst, the interesting, most interesting thing about Satan is, Satan does not want to be revealed. Satan can't stand it when you can see it. As long as you can't see him and he can hide, you'll be a victim. But when you start learning to see him, and the way he comes at you and approaches you and what it's got to say, and you say, uh-uh, hey, you're on your way. Yeah, that's right. And that's exactly what Jesus did. When he was tempted in the wilderness, he told the, he, the devil said, whoa. And the devil, like she said, she, he, the devil throw those thoughts in the mind, but Jesus did what? He combated those thoughts with what? Scripture. And that's why I find it so important that you go through Scripture, that you learn it, that you understand it. Why is it written? To whom is it written? For what reason? And then you'll be able to utilize it in your own personal walk. Um, let me just also add that, keep this in mind, we are battling, and you're battling a spiritual battle. Uh, but the one thing that the enemy wants you to have is fear and worry. All right? And Jesus told us that we should not have that fear. We're going to, if we get to it, I don't know if we're going to get to it today, but there's another part where Jesus tells us what we should fear. But um, Paul pointed out, and the Lord pointed it out as well, that our trust is in whose strength? My strength? The Lord's strength. So, once you have given your heart to the Lord, and you said, Lord, come in and be my Lord and my Savior, Paul said, that no one can do what? Pluck you out of the hand of God. Nothing in heaven, nothing on earth, nothing in any depths, nothing. So always have the confidence that Jesus said that if you come unto me, I will in no wise what? Cast you out. And he says, lo, I'm with you. How long? Always. Now, that is your foundation. Now, if you, if you mess up and do wrong and, 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 and act up, that shows your what? Spiritual immaturity. Did you need to do what? Grow. You need to what? Improve. Just like a child. Child starts walking. Child's going to stumble, fall. It doesn't mean that the child's never going to walk. It means that the child has to do what? Develop. It needs to get muscle and, and, and timing and, and balance and all that. Same thing with your spiritual walk. You develop that. Th and then what happens now is that you become a better soldier. And you're able not only to fight on your behalf, but you're be able to be an intercessory. And you can help not only yourself, but you can be uh, able to team up to help others. That's what the devil doesn't want. That's why he wants you, if he can't keep you from getting saved, he wants you ineffective. And so this is what some of the tools that he uses. Right. Can I say something? Yes. The other side of that too is the spirit of uh, discernment. When you give your life to the Lord, the Holy Spirit enters into you and is there to help you so that you see those things that are not of you and be able to deal with it. And you have to also learn how to rebuke. Mm. You must learn how to rebuke that because when you see and you know it, you feel that he's here. When he's here to attack you, attack your family, everything around you, and rebuke him in the name of Jesus Christ. You always do because he's got to turn and flee from that mm. because he can't fight that. Mm. But you have to learn it, and you will start to see it. I remember when I got baptized, um, I was baptized many years ago, but I remember when I got the Holy Spirit, all of a sudden I was seeing things I didn't see before. I just said, that thing was always around me, but I never noticed it. But once that came in, I've been doing a lot of work with that mm. and rebuking a lot of things, including people. Mm -hmm. So you gotta, you gotta know he's got he's got the tools for you. Use it. Yeah. I like that phrase you use. Notice, recognizing those things that are not of me. <laughs> you know, sometimes you have to. Say, I'm not like that. But sometimes you see yourself doing something. You're like, that's that, that's not me. Why am I? So that's a good thing to just recognize. Let me, Lord, bring that to the Lord. Let me pray about that. All right. So 
Jesus continues. Remember, what we're looking at. Scribes and Pharisees come to him saying, Teach us, show us the sign. Jesus says, You, you guys are, are, are evil and adulterous generation, and you ask him for a sign? And he goes on. Look what he says. He goes, uh, uh, And yet no sign will be given uh, to it. To What's to it? This generation. That is full of what? Evil and adultery. Or sin, exactly. But the sign of Jonah the prophet. For just as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, or the, or the, the great fish, so the Son of Man will be to this generation. Alright? Three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, what is he talking about here? Nineveh. Who is Nineveh? All right. Nineveh is the capital of, a, of the Babylonian nation. So when you talk about Nineveh, you're talking about, talking about Babylon. Back in those days, Babylon was a fierce, a very fierce culture. We look at Babylon today, historically, and we see them as an ancient, powerful empire that once was, but no longer is. Babylon was also the, the nation that overtook and over, overthrew the, uh, the, the um, southern Israel, which was called Judah, and brought them into captivity. Babylon was a nation that when they took and captured uh, uh, other nations, they took the smartest and most intelligent people from that nation and brought them into their kings to help and, and, and into their rulership to help bring wisdom into their culture. The people that they discarded, they would kill. But they just didn't kill them and leave them on the ground. They would kill them and they would impale them and put them up and have them all around the city. Certain people whom they really wanted to make feel bad, they wouldn't kill. They would do something like bring them in front of their, uh, their family, watch this, this prince, watch his family all be killed. And then, now that's going to be the last thing you're going to see. We're going to see me killing your family. Then they would pluck out their eyes. They would cut off the thumbs. This is, this is the kind of stuff that the Babylonian or, or, and the Ninevites did. They were evil people. And if you remember the story of Jonah, Jonah thought these people were so evil and God told Jonah go preach to these people to repent. Jonah said to God, I'm not going. <laughs> he said, I ain't going. Those are the, those are the, the, there is nothing worse than these folks over here. I don't want them folks to know you because I know how you are God. You God of mercy. And if I go down there and tell these people about you, they're going to believe in you and you're going to forgive them. I don't want them forgiven. I want them destroyed. And that was Jonah. But then God, when Jonah ran away, and there's a whole lot of story I can bring that up, but just to, to kind of sum it up, God convinced Jonah after he spent three days in that, in that well, in that great fish, convinced Jonah, well, I think it may be better for you to go on down there and tell Nineveh what I told you to tell him. All right? And so Jonah went down there, and he began to talk to, to Nineveh. Go ahead, Mark. I see that this particular word as one of the most important words in that particular verse is the word monster. Mm -hmm. you know, because quite frankly, um, I don't think any of us have ever seen a sea monster, have we? Uh, I mean, literally, have any of us ever seen a sea monster mm -hmm. on TV or anywhere else? Have you ever heard such a thing as, I mean, even if you got swallowed up by something as big as a whale, are you going to be alive for three days inside the thing? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. So one of the key words in this particular verse is the word monster. And in looking up the word monster, I discovered that it is a, a synonym of the word jackal. It is also a synonym of the word a heinous beast. Now, a heinous beast does, and a monster does not have to be a literal monster dwelling in the sea. It could be monstrous people with the mindset and the mentality of a beast 
and they don't really care what they do, how much evil they commit, who they kill, where they kill them, what they take from you, your life, your money, your house, your job. They couldn't care less. These people are just beyond what you can imagine. So you can see something like that also, or a person like that as being a monster, which I see as Jonah having been you know, three days and three nights in the center or the midst of a, a heinous people who are just, I mean, I mean, they are just so bad, the you, only word you can use on them is that they're a bunch of monsters. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, that's important to keep in mind, too, because um, the one thing about a monster is it's something that has no connectivity aspect to it. Um, you can't relate. That's why it's called a monster. You know, it's just like, it's, it's, there's something wrong. You, you instantly recognize it. It's, you know, when you see somebody walking in here and he has, you know, the feet of a, of a dog and the body of a, of, a, of a sheep and the head of a man. Well, first of all, I ain't, we're not going to be just sitting, just sitting still. <laughs> it's going to be, gonna be some moving around in here. So we go, because what? That's a monster. And so... It's the same thing when you try to have part of God, part of this world, and part of these systems, and you're trying to mix different things. Your religion becomes what? Monstrous. Right? Because you need to, to follow who? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God uh, that Moses talked about. The God that Paul talked about. But what people have done is they, they have brought together a a conglomeration of all philosophies and turn religion into something mon monstrous. Is this, did I say it work? Did I say it right, Regina? Monstrous. Monstrous. <laughs> See, I gotta help me. My, my my oldest daughter is an English lit major and she's like, Dad, you 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 can you just tear up words. I go, I know. But I know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> but a monstrosity uh, is just uh, bad. So now Jesus says to them, to these Pharisees and these religious leaders of his day, that you guys are looking for a sign. I'm not showing you no sign, but there is a sign that you will see. Now, whether you catch it or not, just like how Jonah was in the, the, the belly of that sea monster for three days and three nights, the Son of Man uh, will be in the uh, heart of the earth for three days and three nights. Now, what sign? is Jesus pointing to? We know his what? His death. His death. Burial and what? And, and resurrection. resurrection. So that's the sign. So the, an evil generation needs to know nothing except Jesus died for you and rose for you. Now, if you are evil, you don't need to know how to uh, overcome uh, bad habits or how to overcome uh, evil thoughts or how to fight against uh, uh, spiritual wickedness. You, you don't have to deal with it. What you've got to deal with is the fact that your eternal state is heading towards a hellish end. And that's the thing you have to fight against. So you've got to know Jesus. That's the only sign that an evil and uh, uh, God-rejecting person needs to know is Jesus Died and rose for your sins. He paid your bill. Because until you get your bill paid, you can't use anything else in here. Now, God is merciful. So therefore, when it rains, it don't just rain on the people that believe in God. It also rains on the what? The people that don't. People that don't. Right? So he, he's merciful in that aspect. But if your bill is not paid, let me rephrase that. If you don't accept that your bill is paid, because he died for what? All sin. Mm -hmm. But if you don't accept that your bill is paid, then it's, it's, you're not going to catch the benefit. You're not going to receive what's right. So Jesus is letting them know, you want to see a sign. The only sign I'm going to show you is the sign like Jonah. That I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be three days in the heart of the earth. But then look what he says. And now he's telling them. Because he knows their heart. And he knows they're not going to do what? they're not going to adhere so he goes on and he says he says the men of Nineveh will stand up 
and the judgment with this generation and will condemn it. For they repented at the proclamation or the preaching of Jonah. And behold, one greater than Jonah is here. So what he's saying is, he's talking to those Pharisees. He goes, you remember that old story of Jonah? And you saw how those evil people, those Ninevites, how they repented at the, at the words of Jonah. Excuse me. And yet here I am, the promised Messiah, standing in front of you. And I'm telling you what you need to do, and you won't hear it. Mm -hmm. So the people at the judgment, and this is where you recognize, wait a minute. The people at the judgment, the Ninevites at the judgment, the, those people are dead and gone. Well, they are. But what that tells us is that death is not the what? The end. It's not the end. Those people at Nineveh that repented have what? Eternal life. Because they believed who? Jonah. Because Jonah. Jonah was preaching the words of who? God. God. And that's the, that's the beautiful aspect about uh, being a messenger of God. When God told Jonah, go tell Nineveh, and of course we know the story how he didn't, but when he finally went down there, Jonah was working at, at, on whose behalf? God. God. He didn't go down on his own, because on his own he didn't want to go down there. So when someone tells you what God tells, uh, what God has said, is that person speaking on their own? No. So I'm not saying to you, give your heart to the Lord, because I got anything to give you. If you're going back, you know, based on my words, looking for something from me, you, you, you're out of luck. I have nothing. I'm telling you what God told us to tell you. What God says, tell every man, tell every woman that the bill is paid. And we got to let our friends know, our family, our children, our husbands, our wives, our brothers, our sisters know. Your bill is paid, man. Turn on the cable. It's paid. Mm -hmm. All right? Turn on salvation. Amen. Because it's been paid for. Yes, Mother? A, a statement. A brief statement. Mm -hmm. it, it, let's take it to, back to the day of Nineveh and just bring it to today. Mm -hmm. The people of, the, of Nineveh repented mm -hmm. at the word being preached. Consider this world, and especially America, where we live. There's no amount of preaching that goes on anywhere that is causing this country to repent of the wickedness that's going on within it. Well, I mean, Mother, that's a statement. Lord, how much time we got? <laughs> we got we got one minute. Oh. <laughs> I don't know if I can. All right, here I go again. Can I can I get can I get yes. five minutes? <laughs> Make it ten. All right, thank you, Mother. Make it ten. Um, the the preaching that 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 we have going on today. Wow. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I'm, I'm saddened to the effect that most preaching that we have today let me, let, me not, let me not say most a lot of preaching that we have today is built on self-service because I want something from you All right. I, 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 I want something from you I'm, I'm, but yet I'm going to call you good I'm going to say hey man, man you know, hey what's up you know, but the bottom line is, let's like the Pharisees. They call Jesus what? Teacher. Teacher. But the, the whole thing is they're trying to work something. It's all, you know, and, and you, have to, you have to open your eyes to that. Because, yes, you will have that. The simplistic of preaching is that Jesus died for your sins. That's all you need to know. Now, you, then you just got to get to know who Jesus is. Then, of course, once you get in, there's a lot to learn. But you got to, the main thing is you just got to get in. You got to accept the preaching. And I'm going to stop with that because I can go on and on and on with, that, with this. But you got to just accept the fact that Jesus died for your sins. The preaching about health and wealth, about uh, pie uh, uh, now give me give me my, my, my gain and, and, and you should never be sick if you love the Lord I mean like I said I could go on and on with all of this that's not godly preaching that's self service because when it's all said and done the last thing they're going to tell you 
Now, if you just send me a donation, <laughs> if you just, now, we're going to sow a seed. We're gonna, and, and, the, and they have a whole lot of ways of saying it and whatnot. But the bottom line is, they're in it for themselves. When Jesus gave us the example, he died for us. So therefore, he says that we should walk accordingly. How do you die to help others? That's a question you should ask yourself. What am I planting into the earth? Into people. When I say earth, you're planting into the, into the community. Into your, your family. Into your friends. What are you planting? Not looking for anything in return. Dying. And, and allowing it to do what? To grow. But everybody seems to want to have an angle and a benefit, and I want something out of it, and I really want something out of it, you know, when it's all said and done. And some people are really patient, because that's how the devil is. See, the devil will let people worship money and fame, and they'll have it for 20 and 30 years, then the next thing you know, this guy just OD'd. Now, we see it as OD, and that's how it goes on the birth certificate, on the death certificate. And because we're not there and we don't always see in the spiritual realm, we don't know really what spiritual fight went in to cause this person to take those pills that day to knock them out. I can't go into that any depth, but I do know this. And reading the scripture, the Bible tells us not to be ignorant of the what? The devil's devices. And I know how the devil works because the Lord has what? Revealed it to us. Mother, go ahead. Last statement for me at least. <laughs> uh, John chapter 10 verses 28 and 29. Know for a fact that if you are a child of God, there is no amount of trouble, trial, tribulation, hunger, nakedness, or anything else that humanity can come up with. If you're a true child of God, there is nothing anyone can do to you that will be able or have the power to pluck you out of his hand. That's right. Your That's right. Is it is. His. That's it. That's it. That's true. Let's finish this up. Let me, let me use my last couple of minutes to finish up story 153. Jesus continues, and he says, the, he gives another example. He says, the queen of the south, and we, we can recognize that as the queen of Sheba, the queen of the south will rise up uh, with the men of this generation uh, at the judgment and will condemn it because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, one greater than Solomon is here. So, what is this? We read the story of Solomon, the son of David, who built this who built Israel up to its, its uh, highest height from a natural standpoint and, and its ability to have all of what God can show an individual or a group or a nation can have on this earth. This is, this is at, at this particular time, a sinful place still. And even when Solomon was building up his empire, it was still being built up on a sinful uh, uh, earth but with God's favor, look at what he was able to accomplish. And word got out. This man is doing wonderful stuff. He's ruling. His, his, his words are, are words beyond. The queen of the south heard about this man. And said, I, wanna, I, I, I heard about it. And I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to go and see. So she got her caravan together and she what? She traveled all the way out so she could see it what? For herself. What's the lesson there? Jesus is telling them. You guys have heard a whole lot about what you think I am. Moses prophesied about me. The scriptures talk about me. Every Jewish festival points to me. The scriptures were written to talk about who I am. And all of this proclamation about the Messiah and I'm here and I'm standing in front of you and you still won't come to me to find out my wisdom, my guidance. But yet the Queen of Sheba was way out in the south and just heard about Solomon and she traveled up. 
But yet a greater than Solomon is here. With greater wisdom. And you don't inquire. You don't ask. Now, let me um, um, close with this. When you wake up in the morning and you start your day and you're getting ready to go, you're going based on your what? Your, your, what you know you need to do that what? That day. But who has a greater wisdom about what needs to be done that day? So how, would you, how could you really start your day with second class wisdom? Because, and I'm being generous when I say second class, that's how our wisdom is. It's, it's, it's not God's wisdom. So then we start our day going on. Because I, I, we know what Monday's going to be. Monday, I got to go back to work. Got to get in the car. Got to drive down 84, 684. Got to get, gotta get there. But before I do that, I got to say, Lord, I thank you for this day. And guide me. Lead me. And you say, well, don't you need to say more than that? Oh, well, I could. But basically, that's, that's it in what? In a nutshell. I need God's what? Wisdom? Mm -hmm. I need his guidance. Mm -hmm. I need his help. His protection. All right? Oh, and you need to acknowledge him. And, then, and you need to acknowledge him. Yes, you do. He is my what? He is my God. Mm -hmm. All right? That should be a daily thing. Now, if we're not doing that, we're doing less than what the Queen of Sheba did. Mm -hmm. What the Queen of the South. But see, he's condemning these Pharisees because these Pharisees, they don't want to give up what they have. They think that the way they have established it can't get no better than this. We're in religious leadership. We got Rome kind of like uh, agreeing to our leadership here. We got the people looking at us, and the people think we're wonderful. They, you know, they got the honor and the prestige. You know, when they stand in the marketplace, you know, they, they like to hear them call them rabbi, and and they 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 get all the honor from the people, and they're loving it, and they don't want it to change. But Jesus is saying. You are going on your own wisdom, thinking that that's really prestige. The Queen of Sheba, she's going to stand up in the judgment and condemn you. Because a greater than Solomon is here, and you don't even inquire about his wisdom. So, in a nutshell, that's what we do. That's what we're, we're here. I'm trying to inquire. I'm trying to get it. I'm trying to, oh God, well, what, what you got to say? There's so much, there's so much in here. What, what can I glean from 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 your wisdom for today. Because things are going to happen. Because even though I may get up. And I may pray. God lead me. God me. Protect me. I will never doubt that he's doing that. Mm -hmm. But that don't mean that I still don't. May not get into an accident. I've gotten into an accident. God ran right in the back of my car. With a van. Did that, did that day can I say. Well God wasn't protecting me that day. No I can't say that. What do I have to always keep in mind? He'll never leave me, nor forsake me. So just like the Hebrew boys, when they were thrown into the fire, did God leave them? No. But they got thrown in the fire. But he didn't leave them. Because when they got thrown in the fire, guess what happened? He was in there with them. And even though they were in the fire, he didn't allow what fire usually does do to them. Sometimes you can go through difficulties, the same difficulties that somebody else goes through, and that person jumps off a building because he can't take it. You, you're still going through. You're struggling, but you go through. You make it to the what? To the other side. And then you begin to develop again. Like the story of Jonah. He was able to make it. He went through it. It wasn't fun. So, what I'm saying is that when you Trust God and you believe him. You got to know he's with you, even in the tough times, even when it's difficult. I'm going through because God's here with me and I don't like it. And I may cry. I may feel I may feel like I'm alone, but I'm never what? I'm never alone, because if I'm alone and I gave my heart to Jesus, that means God is a what? A liar, because he said, I'll never leave you. But God is not a liar. So no matter how alone you may think you are, if you have God as your Savior, you're never alone. We just got to make it through. And God will bring you through. I guarantee you. That's the one thing I can guarantee you. God will bring you through. He will definitely do that. 
All right. Any other comments or questions before we close? All right. Give us a prayer, benediction, brother. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you.